Welcome to Behind the Smile with Ash Butters, a podcast designed to reveal the truth behind the masks we wear. Together, we look to demystify the human mind and its behaviours in relation to mental health, trauma and addiction. My name's Ash and I'll be your host as we uncover the real stories of people's pain and the steps they've taken to live a life of freedom in recovery. From sobriety to spirituality, join me each week as we uncover the reasons why people seek recovery and how their lives have changed by living one day at a time. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Behind the Smile. My guest today is Brendan Watt. Brendan is a worldwide speaker, best-selling author, and facilitator for Access Consciousness, a global empowerment company present in 176 countries. His classes and workshops empower others to know they are not wrong, that anything is possible, and that you are one choice away from change. Since embarking on his own recovery journey in recent years, Brendan has found a new passion in helping others to overcome addiction. He's also an Aussie living in the US, so I'm super grateful that he's made the time to come here and speak with us today. And with that, I'd love to welcome Brendan onto Behind the Smile. Brendan, how are you today? Welcome to the show. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thanks for having me on here. And you're currently in Costa Rica, you just shared with me offline. Currently in Costa Rica. I live in Houston. Um, I currently live in Houston. I moved there just before the lockdown, which was interesting because people people are confused. They look at me and they go, why did you move to Texas from Australia? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Why not? You know? Yeah, I mean, I think we'll, we'll dive into the reasons why, I'm sure, once we get a bit more into your story. But it's actually funny. I know a few Aussies that have made the, the move over to Houston in the last few years. It seems to be the place to be these days. Tell me, what, what about really? Costa Rica, though? What, what inspires you to be spending time down there? Well, so we started, um, we started building a resort. I'm shares in this resort that we're building down here in Costa Rica. We started it years and years ago and um, a lot of friends of mine, a lot of people I know invested in it. And we've basically gotten to a point where we're just about to open this place. We've got our first event here <clears throat> in a, uh, like a month. And I was like, I'm gonna come down and just help out and um, help them get the place ready. But basically for me, it was like, I needed just a change of scenery. Mm -hmm. That's mm. been, I think that that's been a big part of my recovery in the last 18 months. The first 12 months were, were difficult for me because I, I kept trying to do things the same way I'd done them in the past. Oh, yes. You know, but without the drinking. And I was just going, it's not working. It's just, I'm miserable. Yeah, it's try. It's when we try and fit our old life into our new reality and there's this real disconnect, isn't yeah. there, which creates discomfort. And when you're sober... Well, my experience anyway is I can't sit in discomfort for too long anymore. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. you, I, totally. You know, and there's got to be that, that. And it kind of brings everything up in your face. And mm. it was interesting, actually, a weird conversation that I was having with, with a friend of mine a few months ago when I actually chose to come down here. I, I was talking to him and I was like, hey, can, can you help me look at something? And I was telling him what was going on and I was like, I kind of feel like I'm like living in this in-between land, like kind of living in this purgatory. And um, he's like, okay, so did you, like, was your life kind of over 18 months ago? Did you kind of get to the end of it, but haven't acknowledged it? And I went, yeah, well, like I tried really hard to kind of get out of here, you know? And when in acknowledging that and just going, oh, wow, like I actually am really different now, but I'm trying to do things the same way. My mm -hmm. life's, that was, that was a big turning point for me. My life started to, you know, change again. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's amazing when we, we, we become open to the messages, but I think before in our old lives, we're so closed off to what, what's really true for us and where we need to be. We kind of just keep, Pl trudging through life and just pushing through the discomfort as we just shared, but then you, you get sober and these messages come through and they're clear and they're loud and you can't not listen to them. Yeah. True story. You know, and yeah. they just get louder and louder. And that was, that, I think that was the big thing for me is I could, 
like from the outside, my life would look really different. Like even before coming on here, I kind of was thinking about, you know, the last even 15 years of my life. And I'm like, wow, I must look like a complete nut job from the outside, right? <laughs> Going from living in Australia as a tradesman, like really struggling in my life to then beginning to travel to them, um, you know, being this worldwide speaker with a lot of people like that I'm working with and, and engaged with. And, and I'm like, how, what, how did that even happen? But, but all the while still having this sense of never being enough, you know, mm. ever. Mm. Ooh, that's big. Yeah. I, I totally resonate with that. And th there's that whole idea that when we struggle with things like perfectionism, the goalposts, they just continue to move. And it's really yeah, not until story. you realize it's that internal work that we need to do, isn't it? That internal fulfillment where you get to the point that it actually doesn't matter what's happening outside of you because you're fulfilled and you're happy from the inside. Yeah. yeah. And that part, that, that part's been a big thing for me is like actually getting to like myself, mm. you know, where it was because I had made so many, uh, I'd made so many outside things, but also people the sources for things in my life, the sources for joy, the sources for money, the sources for basically success or knowing that I was getting my life right. And, you know, and I see for a lot of us that we do that, but it basically you set yourself up for failure from the beginning, because if the source doesn't provide it, then you can't receive it anyway. Mm. You're constantly looking for, these things outside of you to provide something that you already are mm. just sets up misery that coupled with addiction or alcoholism in my case you're you know you're not going to be creating much fun in your life absolutely not and you've just reminded me i was i had the privilege of hearing someone share yesterday morning i was at a meeting with my dad and they said they were talking about this idea they'd been sober 20 years and they wow. were sharing about this idea of working towards a goal and then getting the goal and then realizing that that wasn't the thing that you were looking for or it didn't fix the god-shaped hole like you were still like oh no now i've got it and this hasn't worked now i'm really fucked <laughs> like yep. Yep. Yeah, that's yeah, it's 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 a complex journey that we're all on, I think, as humans on this earth. It is. And but also we we make it so complex. Mm. You mm. know, and man, I have like I'm guilty of all of this over the years. Like sometimes I look at I look at a lot of the choices I've made and it's taken me a while to be able to look at them and go, "Wow, I'm not the brightest crayon in the box." But also <laughs> to not do it from judgment because see, that's where we all, we all kind of try and avoid the things that we've decided are judgeable about us, but in avoiding it, we've made the judgment real and it kind of keeps us stuck anyway, rather than going, wow, I made that choice. It didn't work out. I wonder what gift is in it that I'm not acknowledging also. Mm, mm, mm. That's really powerful, isn't it? Because there is in every opportunity and every setback, there's a lesson to be learned. And we can either choose yeah. to stay open to the lessons and grow from them, or we get stuck in this cycle of self-pity, the hamster wheel, feeling devoid of any hope. So yeah, there yeah. is always an option and a choice there. Brendan, I'd love to let our audience just get to know you a little bit better before we dive into the meat and bones of this interview today. So you've already mentioned that you currently live in Houston, Texas, but you're spending a fair bit of time down in Costa Rica. What does an average day look like for you? Uh, well, lately I've started traveling a lot more again. So traveling more and facilitating classes, but, um, but also working on some different things. So an average day, I would say, you know, is kind of spent in question of, I wonder what I could actually create today. You know, I wonder mm -hmm. what would be fun today. What could I contribute today? You know, and that shows up in many different ways. It could be, you know, recording videos. It could be not wanting to do anything. It could be talking to people. It could be, you know, I try and stay out of the structure as much as possible, but also, um, like I said, I've started traveling a lot more. So that's, that probably that that's a lot of my time these days is traveling, facilitating classes, mm -hmm. um, you know, working on different things. And tell me, how were you drawn towards access consciousness? 
I was miserable. <laughs> and, you know, it was 13 years ago and I was at, I was, I just got out of a relationship with my, with my kid's mother. He was four at the time. So I'm sharing a bedroom at my mother's house and, but I was miserable. Like, and it wasn't the relation, wasn't the breakup of the relationship that was creating miserable. It was basically my life. I had tried my hardest to be what everybody told me me I needed to be in order to create this happy life, this fulfilled life. And I was miserable and I hated it and I hated myself. And, um, you know, I just gotten to a point where I was like, okay, universe, whatever is out there, help, you know, I need something different or I basically don't want to be here anymore. And I found, I found this little ad in the newspaper. It said, all of life comes to me with ease and joy and glory call Mel. And I was like, what? And, um, something, there was something about this. And I called this girl and she, you know, she offered me this session that she was doing on something called the access consciousness bars, which is basically a hands-on body process. And it's about clearing your basic, basically about clearing all the crap out of your mind, you know, mm -hmm. deleting your computer bank. And I had no idea what, what this was, but I went and saw this girl and I got this session with her and I sobbed for an hour and a half. She did this session. I sobbed for an hour and a half. And it was just like all the, uh, everything that I had piled on me that I'd piled on myself over the years began to just kind of start falling away. And it was the first time after that session in many, many, many years that I had some sense of space. And that was the beginning, you know, I started, I found access and started reading some books, actually started reading some books that the founder Gary Douglas wrote. And I was like, wow, this shit's speaking to everything that I knew is possible mm. that I haven't heard anyone talking about, you know, and that was the beginning mm. of a, of a really cool journey that it's that I've been on since. Mm. Tell me, Brendan, what was some of the things in air quotes? What were some of the things that you thought you needed to be happy that you had attained and then realized, oh, this isn't it. Oh man, everything relationship. You know, I remember, I remember as a kid it, that, you know, you look back on it now and I was like, wow, the programming really begins early, you know, and the conditioning of, you know, my, my dad, basically, he was quite a full on creature. And he was, you know, basically the idea of being an Aussie man was you, you're rough and tough, you play football, you drink a lot, um, you get a relationship, you have a kid, you know, but, but that was everybody's kind of what they project and, and impel into your world was it's like, this is what you need, you know, and, and in my kind of, um, in the kind of community or the kind of the, the stratosphere that I was in with all these people in my kind of bit, it was this Aussie, more Aussie kind of small town mentality, mm. you know, cause Australia has, you know, the, basically the tall poppy syndrome, which is don't get too tall. You'll be cut down, but it also has some, some places where they're willing to have bigger lives. I wasn't in one of those places, you know, so it was get a trade, um, have a kid, have a relationship, basically, you know, pay your taxes, pay your rent, maybe get a house if you can. And so I was trying to do all this shit and I was just going, I hate myself. I hate my life, mm. you know, and none of this is making me happier at all. It, it wasn't, wasn't giving me any sense of, um, being of value to anything. Mm. Mm. What do you think led to the breakdown of that relationship with your son's mother? Uh, well, she was, she's what I had as this ideal, perfect, you know, woman. And, you know, and I had put her in a box of this is what she's going to provide. This is what, this is what this relationship's going to provide. And she'd put me in a box of this is what this relationship is going to provide. He's going to be the perfect father. And it just, it doesn't work. You know, there was too many projections from both of our sides until we got to a point where I'd lost me you know, she'd lost her and, and we weren't really going anywhere. So it was, I see that, uh, you know, a lot with, 
the way that we create relationships here is it's basically done from a lot of projections and expectations. And once again, a lot of making that other person the source for creating something in your life. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's almost like when you make somebody else your higher power or you pedestal them, you're no yeah. longer equal and relationships need to be two equals coming together, don't they? Well, I think they definitely need to be two people who are willing to are willing to be a contribution to each other, but also not do it from this thing of, well, this thing of transactional reality, mm. you know, which is where a lot of us function. It's like, you know, scorecard or transactional reality. Tip for or, tat. Or, yeah. Tip for tat, yeah, which is basically I give you this, what are you going to give me? So it's never about, it's never about receiving. It's always about give and take mm. Mm. rather than you know, having something where it's like, what if, what if two people could actually get together and create something that was not only a contribution to their lives, but also created something greater in the world? Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's really special. Okay, Brendan, so you read this newspaper article, you go and have this uh -huh. session, and then something changes. There's like a light bulb moment. Tell me about the trajectory of the next decade and what led up to this photo that we're going to talk about soon. Okay. Well, the tr that's why I look at it and I'm like, what happened? Um, <laughs> you know, I, so I started with, I started doing some seminars and I basically, I went full on into it. You know, when I'm, I'm a little extreme like that, as we will find out with the stuff with alcohol and different things like that. But it's like, if I'm doing something, I'm doing it. And, <laughs> And so I, my life started changing really quickly. You know, I was going to these seminars, I was meeting people, I was kind of stepping outside of my comfort zone at each chance I could. And um, within, I don't know, maybe 12 months or something, I started working with, um, I started working with these guys. I was just doing like, you know, I started working with them, um, helping with the schedule. Then I started working on some tech stuff, you know, doing some tech stuff in the, with, audio and stuff in the rooms and basically started doing things like that. Like just, you know, I, I wanted to be um, involved in everything with it. You know, my, like I said, my life was changing until one day um, the, the guys that created this, they, they said to, to me and, and somebody else, they were like, Hey, would you be interested in facilitating these bigger, um seminars and i was kind of just like uh yeah sure you know but that that sent me into this other um this other whole new universe where i was really there for facilitating people i was doing some bigger i was doing a lot bigger groups and stuff like that but for me it was it was definitely a point where i made a lot of decisions about who i needed to be and how i needed to show up in the world Mm -hmm. You know, now people need me and I need to be seen as this and I need to be you know, just a lot of different things went on in my world from that point. Mm. Did you find that there was an inner critic going on there at the time? Oh, there's always been an inner critic. Yeah. You know, I'm definitely one of those people who has that, um, who has that down, but I think that's, I think for a lot of us, we have that, you know, for a lot of us, we're much, we're much better at being in judgment of ourselves than being in judgment of anyone else. Mm. And were you I'm using alcohol as a way to quieten that voice and to feel more comfortable in the work that you were doing? I would say alcohol has just been there my whole life. You know, I remember, I mean, mm. I started, I had my first drink, I think I was 14 and I always knew it was, I was different with it. You know, people would stop and they'd be like, okay, let's go and do something. I'd be like, where's more alcohol? Mm. You know, I, I always, uh, I always knew that there was something off with me and, and that, but I didn't, I never wanted to look at it, but yeah, alcohol's always been there as this uh, safety line. You know, if things get a little bit too uncomfortable, I've always got the alcohol. Mm. It was always my, you know, escape path. 
Mm. I can relate to that a lot and especially using alcohol as a way to quieten the voices, the inner critic. Um, I started drinking at a really similar age. I think I was about uh, 12 when I had my first drink, but was properly drinking around the age of 14. And it was, it was like you just said, it was that escapism. And I knew I drank differently from everyone around me. But I would surround myself with big drinkers. It's just that, yeah, I just yeah. not having that off switch and then, but still very much being able to do all of the things that I was required to do, which creates this disconnect because I'm presenting one version of myself, but the reality is I'm actually very different. And my internal world felt just really chaotic from a really young age. And it's, yeah, that it's, as we know, it's progressive and it, it takes us to a yeah. point where it's no longer fun. It's no longer working. So that leads us now to your photo, Brendan. I'd love you to describe for our listeners, our audience, the photo that you've brought in today. This is a photo from a time in your life where you were hiding behind a smile. You were projecting one version of yourself to the outside world, but the reality was you were struggling on the inside. So for our audience that can't see the photo right now, what am I looking at here and what was going on for you at that time in your life? Okay, so this that photo is actually pretty recent. Um, it was that photo was taken uh, last year, the beginning of wait, no, not last year. Yeah, the beginning of last year, right? Um, that photo was taken, I think, in January. I just facilitated this this class in Istanbul. That photo was taken in Istanbul, Turkey, and I was actually sober at the point but not getting any help. So this was right before, I think this was probably about two months before my big relapse that I had. And so I was sober, but not getting any help. So I was basically not drinking, but not sober. You know, I was, <laughs> I was miserable. It was, it was a time bomb in there waiting to go off. You know, I, I looking back at it now with that, with that photo, I was actually isolating a lot. Um, you know, I didn't want to be around people. I just didn't want to deal with anything. I didn't want to deal with, with the stuff that was coming up in my world. I didn't want to deal with the, the, the awareness that I had that if this wasn't going to change, if I wasn't going to change something that my life was going to head down a path that it wasn't going to be much fun, you know? So mm. I think for me in that photo, there was a lot of, there was a lot of not wanting to look at things mm. Mm. you know and there was a lot of let me just show the let me just show the world that i'm kind of sober and i'm getting help and you know and that i'm dealing with this but but i wasn't at all mm. How, what was going on for you with your mental health at that time uh at that time i would say just uh, a lot of not wanting to talk to people about it you know mm. the thing with the thing I think with alcoholism and with addiction is there's so much stigma on it that it's like, I was kind of at a point where I didn't really want to, I didn't really want to open that can of worms in the world, you know, and be like, Hey, world, I'm kind of fucked up right now. Um, I don't know how to deal with this. You know, I'm facilitating, uh, I'm facilitating everybody else on how you can have a more conscious life, how you can have a, have more ease, have more joy, have more possibilities in your life. And I'm fucking miserable and suffering on the inside. That was my, um, that was where the image had, I was using it against myself basically. Mm. And I see for a lot of us, we do that rather than just go, Hey, you know what? Um, I got some really cool stuff. I got some really shitty stuff. I got some stuff I don't know how to deal with. I got some stuff that, Hey, some days I don't want to get out of bed. I got, um, some days where I like myself, some days where I don't like myself, but I'm here. Mm. And, you know, and I think that, that for me is the key to a greater world is if you can just show up and be like, Hey, I got this shit going on and I don't know how to deal with it. I just found out I'm an alcoholic and I have a lot of judgment of what it is to be an alcoholic and I don't know how to deal with it. Can you help me? Yeah. That there is so much power in that. The power you know, and vulnerability. Remember, yeah, but, but totally. And I remember the, I remember the first time that word came up, alcoholic. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine about it and he brought it up and I was just like, I did not want to hear it. 
it took me days of processing and days of conversations to even be able to look at the idea of being an alcoholic. Cause for me, that was just like the talk about stigma. I had my own stigma of what that was. I'd put it, I'd created a box of what that, what, what being an alcoholic was because of everything I'd grown up with. What was that stereotype to you? Paint a picture for me. Okay. The stereotype for me was, um, I remember the friend that I was talking to, he said, okay, what's your judgment of it? What does it mean to you to be an alcoholic? And I went, the first thing was total weakness, total weakness. And the second thing was, it means I'm my father. It means I'm my grandfather, which, you know, they, they have stories in themselves to those things, which I won't go into, but they were just things I didn't want to look at and I didn't want to deal with. And it took me, um, took me probably at least 12 months to even, to even grasp the idea of not drinking alcohol ever again. Are you kidding me? Mm. It's my best friend in the whole wide universe. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. or let me let me let me correct myself what i thought was my best friend in the whole wide universe it's not actually my best friend because it's <laughs> not very kind to me yes yes oh my goodness i remember having those same thoughts i was still on my way into rehab convincing myself that i was just going there to learn how to drink like a lady like i just couldn't oh, man, I comprehend you. it yeah it's so yeah. crazy in those I, early days i that, but that, and see, cause one of the things I look at and, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really pumped about doing more stuff with addiction and looking at different angles and I'm like, okay, how can I speak to it? What did you, and I look at, okay, is there anything that I could have been for me different that would have allowed me to hear something different back then? And I'm like, I don't know. I may have needed to hit the rock bottom that I needed to hit in order to actually desire to change it. Yeah. It's that gift of desperation, Brendan. I think until you get to that point, you're not going to do the things that are required to stay sober because this journey is not an easy one. It's not, it's not the softer, mm. easier option. I think that if it was more people would do it. This takes a lot of grit and tenacity and commitment, and you've got to show up for yourself every single day, even when you don't want to. So yeah. yeah, I think you've got to have that fire lit underneath you to actually have the drive and the determination to see it through. Yeah, and I think the um, recognize that also for people is there's going to be a lot of the t for me over the you know last eighteen months it's been a lot of times come up where I've wanted to give up, you know, mm -hmm. and I've put another foot forward and another foot forward mm -hmm. and another foot forward and another foot forward and it's always shown up greater. So I think for people too is kind of, um, you're not, sobriety for me is not one choice, you know, and people look for, well, let me find the big choice that I can make that's going to change everything in my life. No, it's the, all the little choices. It's the thousands of choices that you're going to make today that are going to lead you to a greater life. It's not the one choice you're ever going to find that's going to create this, magical mystical life that's out there just waiting for you it's the choices that you make that are going to get you there exactly right yeah we can't think our way through this we've got to act our way through it definitely brendan can you describe yeah. for me because on paper it looks like you're living this dream life you're traveling the world you're facilitating workshops you're speaking to thousands of people and yet your reality is very very different what was alcohol starting to do from a physical and a mental side of things and even maybe spiritual like what was it starting to steal and take away from you uh well it was definitely killing my body um mm. you know i used to there was must have been about three years ago when it started getting really bad you know and i was just you know how alcoholism progresses but you don't really you're like what is happening like it kind of sneaks up on you in this weirdest way. And, um, and, and I didn't realize that until looking back, you know, looking back at it now, but a few years ago, like I would start, I knew my body was dying, you know, and I'd start asking my body questions like, Hey, how long do we have before this is basically irreversible? And my body would give me a sense of, you know, what, a few years, you probably got three years. And so I knew, from I knew from my awareness with my body, I knew based on that that 
it wasn't going to be much longer until my body was going to be dying or dead too. But that was like, um, I could feel it destroying my, my relationships, you know, the trust that people had in me, it was definitely taking away any sense of, any sense of, of the, of knowing that I could do anything without it, you know, I'd become dependent on it big time. Mm. 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 It got to a point where without, you know, I couldn't go a day or two without it at all. Mm. Mm. But you would describe yourself as quite high functioning, wouldn't you? Yeah, definitely. Yep. Mm. I could, I could, I still created a phenomenal life, but, but once again, it's like, it's, anyone can make money. Mm. Anyone can create a relationship that works. You know, anyone mm. can do those things. If you really want to do those things, you can do those things, but it's, it's, are they the things that are actually going to give you the sense of why you're actually here to begin with? Mm. Yeah. You know, so that- for me, it's like, you know, I've done all that stuff and it's still left this, it still left this sense of emptiness because I'd made that the, the source for whatever it was that I was trying to create as my life rather than, you know what, it's all here with me. And that's one of the things I love about access is it's about, it's about accessing the consciousness that you as a being already are, you know, we're not missing anything. It's not about, well, let me go out and find enlightenment. It's what would I have to, what would I have to recognize? What would I have to acknowledge about myself? What question would I have to be willing to be to know that I'm already whole and everything that it is that I'm looking for outside of me in this world already exists right here. If I was only willing to choose it and, and also the willingness to have the willingness to be the difference that it takes to, to kind of show up as you, you know, like we said before, that thing with vulnerability to actually show up and go, Hey, like I'm, you know, not having an easy time right now, or I just realized that I have a problem with alcohol, or I just realized I have a problem with drugs or whatever that is. And it's like, you know what? And I'm here with it. Mm. Cause otherwise it's this, see, one of the things I did was it was like, well, I'm see, I desire a world with more consciousness with a lot more of us who 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 recognize we have a lot more choice and a lot more of us who recognize that we together can create a world with more possibilities i desire that and i know that about myself but then so so you got that but then you've got this other part of me that's this alcoholic of you know basically um uh come come like uh, imploding in a, in on myself. So I'm going, well, ha- I have to hide this one, right? I have to mm. hide the one that's terrible and evil and bad and wrong. I have to hide that one in order to be this one. And what kind of a life is that rather than go, you know what? I am this, I'm a phenomenal, amazing person, but I'm also a terrible alcoholic. I'm mm. both. I'm not one or the other. I'm both. And if I think for a lot of us, if, if you have the freedom to have that as your life and living, what else would be possible? Mm. That's really beautiful. As you were talking just then, what really started to come to mind for me as well is this idea of self-acceptance and self-love. And if we can love each and every part of ourselves and stop judging ourselves, then we'll stop judging others. Because as yeah. long as we're judging ourselves, then I guarantee you, whether you think you are or not, you're judging others. And to create a world yeah. and an existence where we're not in judgment of one another, I think that's where that real harmony exists. Well, that's where the that's where the power is at, you know, and it's like in see, one of the things I know about judgment is judgment is only destructive. It's never a creative energy. Choice is creative. But so with any judgment we have of ourselves, it's setting yourself up for destroying you. Um, and see, for a lot of us who are, I am super aware, you know, always have had this super sensitivity to the world around me. So, and I think, I, I think a lot of us listening would relate to that. 
you know, and so you may think, wow, I'm so judgmental of others, but how much are you aware of the judgments that everybody else has in their worlds of themselves? Mm -hmm. So this is one of the first tools I, I got with access consciousness that kind of just summed up my life. I was like, wow, um, was 98% of your thoughts, your feelings, and your emotions don't belong to you. You're just aware of them in the world around you. And I was like, holy shit, that sums up my whole life. <laughs> I would like, I'm this, I'm this five-year-old kid, right? Going to school, five-year-old kid should be happy, but this one wasn't. And, you know, going to school and basically just, just having anxiety, having depression, having sadness, having all of these things. I didn't realize that I was aware of the world around me. And when I, when I heard this tool, so basically the way it works is, um, because I think what we can all relate to this, you know, you'd be having a good day and then all of a sudden you've, you're angry or you're upset out of nowhere. Well, the thing you want to ask is, okay, who does this belong to? Or is this mine? And if it lightens up at all, then it's not yours. You just return it to sender. You just go, okay, well, I return that to sender and, and, and kind of let go of it. But when I found this tool, I was like, holy shit, this is none of it was ever mine. Mm. You know, I was just mm. aware of it. But also, so for a lot of us, what we'll do too is like, some of us will be more in tune with, with sadness. We may have grown up with a lot of sadness, right? Some of us will be more in tune with the, the energy of anger. We may have grown up with a lot of anger, with poverty, with abuse, with whatever that is. So we kind of set ourselves up for whenever that energy is around us anywhere. So you walk into a supermarket and there's angry people in there, you automatically assume it's yours because you're so in tune with that energy. Mm. So for me, it was, it was sadness. It was abuse. It was basically just anything that was miserable or morose. I decided it was me. Mm. And so this is a really cool tool for people to, I mean, and even with sobriety, cause here's the, here's in the early, um, in the early months, it's like when you're like, want to drink, 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 drink, drink. Uh, who does that belong to? You know, mm. ask that question because how much is that your awareness of still everybody else around you wanting to drink and you're picking up on it? Mm. Oh, totally. That's so profound. I'm just like letting that resonate as we have this this conversation right now. It really is about – It remi I work with my clients a lot around – questioning our conditioned thoughts and really mm -hmm. practicing the pause and using meditation as a tool to create that space within the mind so that we can question those conditioned thoughts. Because so often the first thought that pops into your mind is not necessarily true, but we think it is because it's coming from our voice and it's probably really, really loud, but it, it yeah. could be somebody else's reality or it's an old conditioning. It's an old limiting belief that we have adapted as a result of modeling environment all those sorts of things so yeah just being able to really take back control put in that moment and then ask yourself is this even mine and if it's not i love what you said return to sender yeah yeah and i love that <laughs> that um you know we've got to, we've got to be willing to get off the autopilot you know and mm. if you want to create a life that's different it's like start questioning those thoughts in your head you know, when you have a thought in your head telling you you're hopeless or you're you're never going to get through this, I'm sorry, but that is not a thought you should be listening to. Mm. That is not something that you should be putting any more further energy into rather than going, you know what, I'm calling this bullshit from now on. Mm. I'm calling this, if there's ever a thought coming into my head telling me I can't do something, I'm sorry, no more. Mm. I'm done with that. I'm actually going to put my energy into questions of what what can i create and i think for a lot of us too many of us listen to listen to all of the things that kind of make us heavier or twist us up rather than focus more on the things that that give us a sense of lightness mm. oh absolutely brendan can you tell me a little bit more about i want to know what led to this day, the 5th of April, 2022? This is your sobriety oh, date. Yeah. This is yep. the day your life changed forever. Now, I'm guessing that this spectacular relapse might have had something to do with it, but could you share with us more about that time and what was different about this time? 
oh, you know what? I didn't even see it coming. And this was the thing that kept me stuck in it for months was I can say I didn't see it coming, but when I really dig down energetically, that's a bit of a lie because I could see it coming. It just didn't make any sense to me logically. Mm -hmm. Energetically, yes, I could definitely see it coming, but logically, no. And, you know, and I just, I think pretty sure I just facilitated my, the biggest class I'd ever done. I think it was six or 700 people um, a week before it. And out of nowhere, I just, um, you know, I dropped my, my girlfriend at the time. I dropped her off at the airport. I came back to my hotel room. I, and then here's the deal is I took a Xanax. And I don't take, I hadn't, I'm in Mexico at the time. And I'm, I even look at that and I'm like, what was I doing? And so there were so many things. I took a Xanax and then I kind of vaguely remember pouring a drink of just being like, oh, I'll just have one drink. I'm seven months sober at this point, I might add. Wow. Um, yeah. And that was it. 12 days, I, 12 days that relapse was. And, um, looking back on it, there is, there were several times in that 12 days that I should have been dead, you know, and, and I, I actually haven't really said that on too many things. I've mentioned it on a couple of things, but I'm kind of at a point now where I'm like, you know what? I don't, I have nothing that I desire to hide about it. So you asked before about mental health. Um, I think for a lot of us, the, the stigma on mental health is, well, mental health is this once again, it's a weakness or something like that, or it's misunderstood. Who takes, after seven months of being sober, who takes Xanax in Mexico, which is cut with all sorts of shit, um, and pours a drink without not even remembering it, somebody with mental health issues. Mm. That's just period. Like there's no use beating around that and going, oh, well, I thought maybe I could have done it and it would be all right and blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, I'm sorry. If you're doing that shit, there's something not right going on mentally or or, or in your universe somehow, somewhere. And um, so for me, it actually, you know, the interesting part of this is the last five days of that relapse was here in Costa Rica, basically where I am right now. and um, it's interesting being here now because it's such a beautiful place, but I was, when I was here during that relapse, I was not present at all with me. Mm. How has it been going back into that environment sober? Uh, very interesting. I was here for the first time after it, uh, seven or eight months ago in, um, it, it actually brought up a lot of anxiety in my world mm. because there's so much space here that um it's it's really confronting you know when you're like you, you're like for a lot of us we've found it's alcohol we've found some vice to kind of when the space gets too much it almost for me when i'm when i'm in a lot of space or when i'm kind of being a lot of what's true for me the way i would um the way i would describe it energetically best fitting in my world kind of, I don't know if this makes sense is mm -hmm. loneliness, mm -hmm. like this sense of real loneliness. And I think for a lot of us, that's what we've been avoiding as if it, as if it is loneliness. Like mm -hmm. we've got this thing of, wow, I, I have so much space. Now I feel lonely. Let me fill it in with relationship. Let me fill it in with alcohol, smoking, drugs, money, lack of need of something, you know, all the stuff that we do rather than let me take a step into it which is what I've only, it's taken me a while to get here. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah. is, is take something. I, I use myself with this in the loneliness part, for example, because I'm, it's what's going on for me right now. But I would say for people listening is take something that's kind of an uncomfort in your world. It may be something you don't want to deal with. Maybe looking at, sobriety it could be looking at something in a relationship it could be anything that you just kind of like oh man that's uncomfortable like and be with it 
you know, take, be with it, kind of get the energetics of it and be with it and then take another step into it and acknowledge that it's not bigger than you. Mm -hmm. It may get really uncomfortable. It may get really like, I want to run away and I want to go and drink or I want to go and smoke or I want to do that. Be, be there, be mm -hmm. with it, you know, and mm -hmm. ask for, ask for some contribution from whatever it is around you. Just, but try something different because I think mm. for a lot of us and for a lot of us as addicts in, you know, with alcohol or whatever is we keep doing the same shit over and over and expecting a different result. It doesn't work. Yeah, absolutely. And what I've come to learn is that when I am trying to avoid an uncomfortable emotion and, you know, I don't drink anymore, but maybe I'll try and avoid it with sugar or a re my relationship or, got shopping, who knows? Like, oh, uh -huh. I, I, I'm an addict, so I'll find any which way, you know? And that's, I guess that's where I, I really look at trying to develop my emotional sobriety these days. <laughs> but when I actually just pull back and I carve out time to what I describe, sit in the shit and just yep. let it wash over you, like feel the uncomfortable emotions <laughs> and get comfortable with being uncomfortable, that's when I, that's where I grow. That's where I... I up level every single time. And the more painful it is, the greater the growth every single yep. time. But it's definitely not easy. <laughs> that part. And that's the part for a lot of us we avoid. You know, I'll tell you something because um, I haven't told anyone this part because it's very new. Is so I, I've smoked, I, I began smoking cigarettes basically when I was 12 or 13 as well. Smoked until I think probably eight years ago then started vaping because it's way healthier you know <laughs> so i vaped i vaped and vaped you know and so 18 months ago i was like well i ain't giving up vaping because at least i've got this you know yeah three days ago when i was leaving to come down here i went i'm done that's enough finished and so i left everything didn't bring any you know didn't bring any vape or anything here and it has been uncomfortable as fuck Yes. <laughs> three days. It's been three days, but it's it made me realize how much um, I was using that as another thing in my life to um, to basically destroy me, like mm -hmm. to destroy the power that I am, to destroy the presence that I am. And I was just like, I I have been so many mixtures of things over the last three days. But one of the main things that I've noticed has come up in my world is a lot more what I would have misidentified in the past as anger, but it's more so how much, it's more of a recognition of actually how much power that I've been suppressing with it as well. How much mm. of the, how much of the man I want a bigger life or, or man, I want more ease in my world, but you know how we, we tend to, one of the things we do with power is for a lot of us, we misidentify that energetically as anger. And mm. we can't be angry, right? You can't be angry because that's bad. That's terrible. How much power do we suppress with that too? And, and I bring that up because I really like to, we're, we're still on this journey. Mm. You know, like with the sugar and stuff, it's like when you realize shit like that, you're like, oh man, like, fuck. Oh yeah. yeah, Brendan, I tell you what, at two years sober, I picked up smoking again. Like I'd given it up in rehab. Two years uh -huh. sober, I had an, like an emotional bottom. It was one of the few times in my sobriety that I wanted to pick up a drink and I yep. didn't, but I did pick up cigarettes and I ended up smoking for six months, which was just crazy because it had taken me, you know, I'd been smoking since I was 15, gave up in my, yep. in, at, at 32. And then all of a sudden I was smoking again. And I remember speaking to my sponsor at the time and she said, as long as you're not drinking, don't worry, like this will fall away. This is just, this is just a crutch that you're leaning yeah. on. And I'm by no way advocating smoking on the show by all means, but like, Hey, congratulations, three days. It's not easy to do. And I've absolutely yeah. been there. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I, but yeah, it's like, I, I realized I was like, shit, I've had nicotine in my body since I was pretty much since I was like 12 or 13 and yeah. I'm, my body's doing some weird shit. And I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> But the difference, the difference now is for me is I'm willing to be with it. Mm. 
in the past, I would have been doing everything I could have to get away from this. And I'm just yeah. like, okay, cool. Hi, I'm here with you too. And it's yeah. just, it, it's interesting. How many years are you um, sober now? Three and a half now. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So on the journey and just my life, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for anything. It's just been yeah. the most, the best decision I ever made in my life. Yeah. That's cool. Me too. Brenda, what yeah. have you learned about yourself in the last 18 months? What's been like the biggest light bulb moment? Uh, <laughs> you know, one of the things that I, I've actually learned more than ever that I actually like myself. Hmm. I like who I am. And that was that, that's taken me a while to even get close to being able to say, and actually mean it for me, not, not to, to say so that other people will like me or not to say that somebody else, not to say it. So other people will think anything it's, I actually do for me. And I think that's, um, that's really different. For me personally, if you knew me for, for the last, you know, 40 years, you'd be like, holy shit, you're getting somewhere if you can like yourself. Mm, mm. <laughs> you know, like... It's pretty big though, isn't it? Because we do, when we, when we spend decades in addiction, we're constantly in this cycle of guilt, shame, and remorse. And our yeah. self-esteem is all but, well, I can only speak for myself. My self-esteem was completely decimated. Oh, you're speaking then, for me too. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we get sober and we start showing up for ourselves and we start to become reliable again and people yeah. begin to trust us again. And then over time that self-esteem rebuilds. And as a result, yeah, I, I absolutely, I'm the same. Like I really do deeply love myself today. And when I look back at the woman in the mirror, I really respect her. And I don't think I could have said that for, for two decades of my life. Yeah, no, truly me. Yep. Yeah, me neither. You know, cause yeah. a lot of it was, a lot of it was built on a lie mm. for me. And what are you doing differently these days? Cause I know you had multiple attempts, like you were sober for seven months before that final relapse. What does your recovery look like today? And how is that different? Uh, I would say the uh, very different today because I know without a shadow of a doubt that I'm an alcoholic. Mm, I know so that you've my, had that acceptance. I know that my body is allergic to alcohol. And if I take one drink, it's all over again. So mm. I, I know that without, there is no, there is no maybe in my world. Oh, maybe I could have like one drink or that's, that's gone. And, um, so that, that solid first step of, of the 12 step program, the, the solid step number one for me is vital and, um, you know, and I have that. So the rest is I, I go to meetings occasionally when I have space, which is kind of just a good check in for me. And um, other than that, I I'm looking at what else I can be in the world for, you know, with like what you're creating and stuff like that. Like, what else can I be for breaking away this stigma of, of addiction? And what else mm -hmm. can I be? It's not only it's not even just addiction, but the whole mental health and yeah. Um, yeah people like look at what COVID created you know with the separation in the world and i don't think we're done with that yet either so it's like i would just like to be something different in the world so that people know that they can show up and be them too mm. that's really beautiful and i love that you're feeling so passionate about sharing your message and getting really honest really vulnerable because the, i truly believe the more of us that can get out there and and put their hand up and say, yes, I'm an alcoholic and I'm, I'm not the, living under a bridge homeless, drinking out of a brown yeah. paper bag. You know, yeah. like it, this, this is a disease that can affect anyone and touches most people's lives in one way or another, whether it's through yeah. a relative, a friend, a colleague, it's everywhere. So the more we can remove the stigma, the more we can create space for people to identify and get help, the more we'll be able to change this conversation and really rewrite what it looks like to to have challenges with alcoholism or addiction or any sort of mental health. Yeah, true story. And you've got to recognize that although it kind of feels like it at times, you are not alone, mm. you know, and there is, you are not alone, but also for me, I remember recognizing early on in my sobriety that, that it was going to have to be me that chose it. 
you know, I had a good friend of mine say, look, I cannot help you with this. I cannot bail you out of this. You have to do this for you. Mm. And, you know, and I had, and I, I am fortunate enough to have some really beautiful people in my life. And, you know, this, I had a friend say to me, this is going to be the hardest thing you've ever done by far. Mm. And, and, you know, and he was, he was understating it <laughs> by far. <laughs> <laughs> it has been, you know, it has been, but it's like, it's the same thing with, like I said, with the vaping thing, you know, it's been three days and it's been, it's not been easy, but it's been, it's rewarding as fuck. Like you said, it's like, there. that's when you grow. That's mm -hmm. when you evolve as a being. That's when you grow into who, more of who you actually are, which is, that's the thing that's going to give you fulfillment in life. You know, that's the thing that, that's going to make you want to get out of bed in the morning. That's the thing that's going to make you also have the ability to create a relationship that actually works, you know, when you're not using it as something to fill in your life, you know, so it all begins with us in mm. I, but my, my sense is um, for a lot of us who struggle with addiction is we are the, we, you you have a capacity to be something different. You're not going to get access to it until you give up the the addiction stuff. Absolutely. Whatever it may be, the substance, the process, whatever it is, we can't start to do the inner work. Step one, we have to get rid of that stuff before we can <laughs> go deep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah definitely. Brendan, there's one final question that I have for you, and I love to ask all of my guests this final question. So it is, what are your three non-negotiables that allow you to live your life today happy, joyous, and free? My three non-negotiables. Um, oh, man, give me an example. What do you mean? Like three no go. Uh, non-negotiable. So it might be, I'll give you an example. One of mine is my prayer and meditation practice. Uh -huh. Another one is therapy. Oh, okay. So things that you implement into your life every day that allow you to have this, like to not only be sober, but to actually enjoy your life being sober. Yeah. I would say top of that for me is access consciousness, mm -hmm. um, the tools and, you know, the tools and the pro all of that is just that to me is a vital part of my life. Um, horses. Mm. I'm, I love horses and riding, being with horses and nature and all of that and the ocean. You know, the ocean is my, for me, in the weirdest kind of corny, cheesy way, the, op the, the ocean has always been this kind of compass in my world. Mm. And that is that is definitely a non-negotiable don't take the ocean out of my life that's not going to work for me <laughs> that's beautiful i get that i get that that connection to the ocean and connection to universe something greater than us that's beautiful yeah. yeah brendan if people want to find out more about you or access consciousness where should they go they should go they can go check out access consciousness um you know google that go to the website Go to, you can go to my website, which is brendanwatt.com, but I just created this epic little um, free video series and you can get it on my, you can find it on my website, but you can also go to brendanwatt.com forward slash rise, R-I-S-E. And this thing is called Rising from the Ashes. And it's basically 12 videos of me, um, tools, talking about everything we've just talked about going from basically a pile of shit to creating my life again, you know? And so it's, I'm super proud of it and it's awesome. So check that out. Amazing. That sounds like an incredible free resource. So thank you so much for gifting that to everybody, everybody here yeah. on this earth. I will make sure I pop all of that information in the episode show notes. Brendan, we say here on Behind the Smile that when we recover loudly, no one needs suffer in silence. So thank you so, so much for coming here today, for sharing your story and everything that you're doing. Hey, that is mutual. Thank you for everything you're doing. Take care. Bye, Brendan. Thank you. A big thank you for tuning in today. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so by clicking the subscribe button and leaving a review. Every review helps this podcast become more discoverable, meaning more people can hear these stories of strength and hope. 
Together, we will continue to remove the stigma around mental health, trauma and addiction. Remember to reach out to those you care about and I'll see you next time.